while they pull up my PowerPoint. Good morning, church. As is the tradition in our church that the pastor started, we have a kids' quiz. So uh, uh, we're going to go, go through that. And how many of you like playing Who Am I? I always enjoyed that was a favorite Sabbath uh, game that we would uh, play together. Um, so uh, I enjoy this. So uh, we'll have some uh, mentions here. And then uh, if you know who it is, just raise your hand. So here we go. Well, that one's that one was easy. <laughs> we'll try. We'll, we'll, we'll try. We'll try. So this one was the first one. I have eleven brothers. I know a thing or two about dreams. I was sold as a slave. I saved Egypt, and obviously that's Joseph. So let's try the, the next one. And maybe it's not. You know what? Uh, on mine, it was working fine. <laughs> Because I think if you click on it, it's supposed to like advance one at a time. So by memory, let me see. The other one would be, um, I was also a slave. Okay, we'll do number two. I'll see if I can do this by memory. I was also a slave. Um, I was um, thrown in a den of lions. Um, that should be like, right? The, the, like, go ahead. Uh, Daniel. Yes, that would have been Daniel. Um, the main file. Oh, you know what? It's in there. Um, Daniel. The next one. Um, See if I do this by memory. Is um, I was a cupbearer. I think that's the next one. I hope it's the next one. I was a cupbearer, uh, the king. My face was sad. So this is before the king, <laughs> and I know how to rebuild walls. It was Nehemiah. So uh, that was the other one. <laughs> Everybody knew that one, and I think we probably will. For the interest of time, we will advance these, and we'll just go to the next one. So um, well, that's the other way, Joseph. Um, if you can go the, just go uh, to the uh, to the last one. Oh, here's I I know the last one. Or oh, actually, here's here's the other one. Um, we um, our uh, our father was um, first name was Jacob. But his name got changed. Uh, we Moses was our leader. Um, Moses was our leader, and then um, we came out with a lot of money from Egypt. Who am I? Came out of Egypt. My our father's name was uh, was originally Jacob, but it was changed. Do you know who that is? Who, who I am? There's a, there's a hand right there, Mitch. Israelites. The children of Israel, yes. It was the children of Israel. Um, and then the last one, I believe, is um, I put, uh, I put uh, Christians in jail. I was blind for a short period of time. I became a follower of Jesus. Paul. Yes, Paul. Very good. Oh, did she have one right there? <laughs> um, so while we, uh, while hopefully they get um, that going, um, last uh, week, thank you, Mitch. Sorry about that. Sorry, kids. Uh, the technology is... Uh, Sometimes, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, 
So a couple of weeks ago, our pastor preached um, a sermon, um, and he talked about speak up, please, if you recall. And he challenged us to speak up, to share the gospel, and what better place to share it but among us when we give our testimony, we should practice sharing the good news of Jesus and what he's done in our lives. And then last week, uh, Elder Picone, uh, Jonathan, preached a sermon uh, that was entitled, Whom the Sun Sets Free, right? And he shared with us about when we are free in Christ, one of the natural outcomes of that freedom is service. We serve others. That was kind of the natural you know, result of that. Um, and so this morning, uh, one of the things that I'm going to do is try to bring those two sermons together and show you examples in Scripture of how that is fulfilled, okay? That's, that's kind of the, that's the plan, that's the intent that uh, we're uh, going with. So, so the, the title is Collaboration with God. Um, it's interesting that in the word collaboration, uh, in there is the word labor as well, and it's co-labor. Um, so... Uh, here we go. Yes, co-labor. So to collaborate with something, and collaboration is something that's important. It's something that um, everyone does, you know. It's something that is important in business. It's important um, to work together uh, in any organization. You have to collaborate. You have to work together. Um, and so those are the things that we're going to be uh, talking about this morning. But before we do, let's uh, bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, uh, we humbly come before your throne of grace, Father, to ask your spirit to be with us, um, to help us, Lord, to know more about you and to understand this idea of collaboration and how we might be able to collaborate with you uh, more fully. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, the word collaboration uh, as defined by Webster's Dictionary is as in partnership the state of having shared interests and efforts. Um, words that go with collaboration are relationship, alliance, union, oneness, connection, fellowship. And those are all words that we would look at and say, yes, those are the things we want to have with God, right? Those are the things that we want to be with God. Uh, we want to have those things. Um, it's interesting to note that when we look through Scripture, there are words like weight, um, and for example, Psalm 27, 14, this is the idea of wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Another psalm is Psalm 37, 9. It says, for evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Right? Great promises in these uh, psalms. And then Isaiah 40, verse 31, a verse that maybe you are very familiar with. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. On the surface of reading those Psalms, we might get the impression that we need to wait, that that's kind of a passive thing to do, that we would just kind of just sit down and just kind of wait for, for God. That's kind of what it says. However, in the Hebrew, the word wait has a very slightly different meaning. In Hebrew, the word wait is from kav kava, and I'm, I'm sure I'm butchering it, but uh, we're going to go with kava. Um, and that word is from the root to bind together by twisting. That's what the word to wait means uh, in those psalms. So when we read those psalms, and it says to wait on the Lord, means also to bind with him like a rope, to get close to him to be connected with him. That's kind of, so when you read those verses, kind of gives you now a different, kind of gives it a different twist, doesn't it? It's not something that we now, we're just going to wait on God, but it's something that we need to be together with God. It's something that we, we can need to collaborate with God to be with him. In other words, to collaborate. Have you ever done a um, three-legged race? How many of you have done a three-legged race? Well, you know, one of the things about doing a three-legged race is that you're tied together with that partner, you're bound together with them, 
And where one goes, the other one goes, right? If, the, if, the, if, the, if he stops, you stop. If they go fast, you have to go fast in order to keep up. If they go slow, you have to go slow, right? If you have to move through an obstacle, you have to do it, but you have to do it together. You have to collaborate. And that's usually one of the games that is done, you know, um, even for marriage. You know, they'll, they'll tie the husband and wife you know, and say, you know, that's kind of a three-legged race uh, is kind of an example that's used for a strong marriage that the two come together. And then Jesus is kind of the one holding you both together, right? Have you, how many of you heard that analogy? Um, so there it is. Uh, co-labor with God. That's kind of the example of doing a three-legged race. But you can't do a three-legged race uh, without collaboration. In Paul, uh, he tells us in 1 Corinthians 3.9 that he says, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. And uh, in, in the King James Version says, We are laborers together with God. So uh, it's showing us here, Paul's telling us that we are fellow workers with God, that we are together. That's kind of a, you know, it's bringing us together, right? That we're doing it not by ourselves, but we're doing it with God. We are laboring together with God. It's something that um, happens. You can't do it by yourself. Um, it's something that we need. So keep that in mind. A business partnership. So some of Part of this sermon I, I got from uh, Pastor Randy Skeet, and he had this kind of framework, and he talked about the, uh, being a, a business partnership with God, and he uses the analogy of being in a business. So he, he says here, God says, I want to be a partner in the business of your life, but not the silent partner. I want to be the senior partner. I want to be the one seen up front. Now, how many of you are in business uh, on your own or have, have a business? Uh, or have a partnership that you're involved in. Um, so some of you. So I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a part owner in a business. I, have, I started with four partners. Now I have eight partners in our architectural practice. Um, and in that partnership, um, I've known my partner for now, oh, 28, maybe uh, 20, 25 years that we've been uh, working together first as an employee and then eventually as a, as, as a partner. But uh, I've gotten to know them pretty well because we spend a lot of time together, right? And um, early on in our relationship, um, I learned how to do things, you know, the way that uh, our office would, you know, wanted to do them, how we wanted to conduct our practice. Uh, we would do it together, but we spent a lot of time, right? We spent a lot of time together. And so we had this, I, you know, this notion where, I knew exactly how to handle a situation that would come up because I knew how he would handle it because I had spent enough time with him. Uh, and likewise, now I have my younger partners that are following me and I'm showing them how it is that I run the business and how to conduct the business. And, you know, we spend a lot of time together, uh, you know. Uh, and so that's just kind of natural that we, by spending a lot of time together, you kind of establish kind of this bond. And a partnership in, like, in a business is like a marriage. You just spend a lot of time and you get to know uh, those people and uh, you just spend, you know, like I said, a lot of time with them. Um, in, and over those 30 years, uh, my four partners, some of them had certain strengths. So if I had a technical question, I would go to... Uh, Erston, my you know partner, because that was his thing. That's what he really knew. He knew about how to keep us out of litigation. He knew how to detail, how to flash things. He knew how to put buildings together. He he understood that. So if I ever had a question, I could go to him. Uh, if I had a question on design, I would go to my other partner and say, "What do you think of this?" You know. And so we got to know it. But each partner had different strengths. Uh, each partner uh, did things and and had different strengths. And it occurred to me that um, our lives and the idea of being in a business, um, like he says here, that God wants to be the partner of our life. And I just started applying those, that idea about running a business and how you run a business is similar to how you run your life. You know, you have different aspects of a business that need to, somebody needs to take care of. And sometimes you can choose to do those yourself or you can choose to give it to somebody that maybe knows, you know, is more skilled than you uh, to be able to do those things. And so that idea and that relationship, I thought, was uh, interesting. 
How many of you heard of silent, a silent partner, right? There's an idea of having a silent partner. Uh, and that's usually kind of a major investor that comes in and invests in a uh, company. And he kind of pretty much sits in the back. You don't really see him. Uh, he's kind of the silent partner, the investor. And there's another partner that's the face of the company. And they are the ones that you see. Um, but behind that person, the major guy's kind of behind the scenes and he's really, you know, uh, making a lot of the decisions. God wants to be a partner with us, but he doesn't want to be the silent partner. He wants to be the one that is seen. He wants to be the one that is seen. And he wants us to be the junior partner kind of behind him you know, doing the things that he has asked us to do. But I thought this idea um, that our spirituality is not much different, that God wants to work with us. God says he wants to be uh, our partner and run our lives. Can you imagine the God that runs the universe? The God that runs the universe wants to be a partner in your life. He has the time to do it. Time is not an issue for God. Whatever aspects of God wants to do it, how do you think God will run that business? If God is in that business, do you think that God would be successful in running that business? You know, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure it would be very successful in running that business. But God wants to run every aspect of our life. Um, and he wants us to be the junior assistant. But God wants to collaborate with you and me. If God runs the business, it would run really well. Um, but sometimes I think, you know, we might say, well, God, I want you to run the business of my life, but maybe my romantic side, that one is kind of has clearance. You don't have clearance for that. So you don't have, you can't run that part of my life. You'll run these other parts of my life. Or somebody might say, well, you know, you can run the business, but on the accounting side, Lord, I got that handled. I don't want you to get it, get into the finances. I will handle the finances myself. Um, but God wants all or nothing. You can't just give him a part of, parts of our lives. He wants, he wants it all. He wants to be able to partner with us. He wants to be able to do it. He doesn't want just a small part. He wants to run the major part, every aspect of our life. John 5, 19, Jesus is speaking. And Jesus says something really interesting. Jesus says, and Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. So let me ask you, who is Jesus? Who did Jesus say he was? Son of God? Jesus God, right? Is there anything impossible for God? No. But yet here in this verse, it says that Jesus says, I can do nothing, the Son can do nothing of himself. What does Jesus mean by he can't do nothing? Does that mean that Jesus didn't do anything? That's not what it means. Jesus did a lot of things. But what does he mean that he could do nothing of himself? but he only does what the Father does. Have you ever thought to think about what, that, what he's saying? Jesus, in his humanity, right? In his humanity, chooses. He says, I choose not to do things by myself. That's what Jesus is saying here. So if Jesus, as an, our example, chooses not to do anything of himself, but only what the Father tells him to do. That is an incredible story. That is an incredible text. It also means that Jesus depended on God completely. He is saying that he is, was absolutely dependent upon God for everything he did. In other words, he engaged in no independent action. He didn't do anything independent of God. He was bound with God the Father. He was entwined with Him. He waited on the Lord and He was bound together with God. The king of lifestyle, or the kind of lifestyle that this is implying, 
goes totally contrary to our nature. This kind of lifestyle to totally be dependent on somebody else, to totally give up those things, goes against our goes against the grain. The mind of heaven, the mind of heaven says, I could do nothing without God. That's what the mind of heaven says. I could do nothing without God. That's what Jesus was saying here. God depended completely on God. The mind of heaven says, I do nothing without God. But that is so uh, different and contrary than the way we sometimes live our lives or the things that we see um, and the decisions that we make. Maybe, you know, are there been times in your life where you've made decisions without checking with God first? I know that I can say that, yes, there are times where I have gone ahead of God. I have not waited on Him. What are we saying in effect to God? I don't need you this time. But God cannot be needed from time to time. God has to be needed all the time. And this is literal. God has given mankind these incredible promises, these privileges that maybe we don't appreciate. The fact that God wants to spend and be entwined in the business of our life. The God of the universe has a deep, earnest interest in every aspect of our lives. My daughter Hannah, when she was little, um, and she just learned to walk, uh, I remember she's my, my oldest, and now she's having kids. But I remember her, um, she was, had a very independent spirit, and she wanted to do things by herself. And that was almost like one of the first words that she learned, like two words like, that she put together, do it myself. And that's what she would say. I do it myself. I do it myself. And she was just, you know, you would try to, you know, lift something up that would be too heavy. It's like, no, do it myself. You know, and, you know, even like learning, you know, doing something. She'd always want to, you know, whether it was tying her shoes, she would get frustrated. But she would say, I do it myself. She wanted to do it by herself. And, you know, human nature, we try to say, well, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's good. That we're teaching them to be independent, to be able to do things. You know, that's kind of the mentality that we have. It's like, hey, we can bring up our kids to be independent, independent thinkers, independent, doing things on their own. You know, we consider that to be a success. But yet in the context of spiritual lessons that we can take away, there's something about depending upon someone. Like in my business, I know that I, I don't have to worry about certain things because I know I could depend on my partners for certain things. They're there to back me up. But isn't it more important that I could depend upon God? The God of the universe is there. He's there waiting for us. All the resources are available to him. Why would I not trust in him and depend totally on him? So being independent, while it might be something that we all aspire to and think that independence is great, there's something about being dependent on God. To being dependent and living a lifestyle that way. That should kind of, you know, shock i mean when when i really think about it, to be dependent on god for for everything you know we say that we say that we know yes we are dependent upon god but i don't think that we realize the implications of what that means because if we are de totally dependent on god guess who's in charge of the results now it's not us god is in charge of the results we just have to be connected with him So God's notion for us is he wants to collaborate with us. He wants to co-labor with us. He wants to be with us. He wants to spend that time. And so some examples of people who collaborated with God um, were, can be found, uh, oh, and going back here, uh, I can do of myself. This is Jesus speaking, continuing on that. Uh, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will but the will of the Father who sent me. So again, Jesus, as our example, he chose not to live independently of God, but chose to be, live dependent on God. So the first example I have for you of somebody who spoke volumes and who lived freely, uh, like you know, our pastor and uh, Jonathan talked about, is Joseph. The life of Joseph is one that uh, we can look at. And we can say, here's an example in Scripture of somebody who spoke loudly, 
But he spoke not by the words that he said, but, but the things and the way he acted. That's the way we can also do it. So here, reading in Genesis chapter 39, verse 1, it says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Already we know that Joseph uh, was taken down, that he was uh, purchased you know, by Potiphar, Potiphar being an Egyptian. So here we have somebody who is not in their context. He is a slave. Um, and he bought him from the, from the Ishmaelites. And the other thing in verse 2 that we read is, the Lord was, was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. So again, he repeats this idea that he's there with the Egyptian. Joseph has no control of his environment. He's basically, his circumstances are his circumstances. But here, it's interesting. He says, the Lord was with Joseph. And he was a successful man. And he was in the house of, of his master, the Egyptian. Joseph was a Hebrew um, here living in this uh, location. Um, but it says that the Lord was with Joseph. That's indicating to us that that was a collaboration, right? It takes two, right? Paul says that, you know, we were our co-laborers with God. And here we see two. The Lord is one. Joseph is two. The Lord was with Joseph. That's a collaboration. They are there together. They are working together. The Lord was with Joseph. Um, it was a collaboration. And in that, in that relationship, um, so sometimes you might think, well, you know, my circumstances kind of might define who you are. But if the Lord is with you, those circumstances don't mean anything. And the Lord was with Joseph. He was a prosperous man in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And we already found out that in this verse, one that he um, restated the same thing in verse, that was in verse 1, telling us that Potiphar was an Egyptian. So it kind of makes a point twice that Potiphar is an Egyptian. Um, and verse 2 tells us that as Potiphar was the Egyptian, almost emphasizing that by this regard, these negative elements of Joseph's situation, but that the Lord was with him. So this partnership, this collaboration was heightened. So if you're right with God, no man can keep you from getting what God wants you to have. And if God wants you to be promoted, God will, you will be promoted. If God doesn't want you to have something, if you're, if you're connected, if you're a partner with God, then if you're trying to get a promotion, but it's not happening, it's because God doesn't want you to have that promotion. Because you're partnered with God. In verse 3, and it says this, it says, And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. How did his master, who was a pagan Egyptian, know that the Lord was with him? Have you ever thought about that? How did he know that the Lord was with him? He was, he was a pagan. He, was in, he, you know, he, he, wasn't a, he wasn't a believer. How did he know that the Lord was with him? That's an interesting question. He saw that the Lord was with him. His master saw that God, the senior partner of Joseph's life business, his master saw that the Lord was with him. And twice we, you know, we read that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did prosper in his hand. So if you break that down further, when we say, you know, how did he know that his master was with him? Um, he, says, uh, he says this. Um, how, may, how do you tell when somebody's, you know, um, is some, their character, how do you know them? And if you look at it, Potiphar saw that God was with Joseph by the actions and the conduct of his life. What he did, how he treated the other servants, how he treated them, how he treated, you know, you know, the uh, Potiphar's other wives, how he how he interacted. That's how he knew that God was with him. Is how he behaved. Um, we were t talking in Sabbath school uh, earlier, and you know, we spend three hours in church, but there are 168 hours in a week. So, the people that know you pretty well are people that you work with, people that you live with, you know, your families, right? 
they know you pretty well. We can hold our character together for three hours. We can hold things together pretty good for three hours. But what about the other times, right? What do people look to us? How, what do they see in our behavior, in our character? You know, how do, you know, people are watching. How, what, what do they see? But here, you can tell that Potiphar, he saw that the Lord was with him. There was something about Joseph's behavior, Joseph's character that, you know, made this testimony that spoke volumes about Joseph's character. If an unbeliever doesn't see God in us, then there's a problem with us. Would you say that that, that logic would follow? If others are not seeing God in us, it's not the problem with God, it's a problem with something maybe with us, right? God's presence in our lives must be overwhelming or so overwhelming that even an unbeliever recognizes the presence of God even though he may not be uh, might, may, might not know the name of God, just like in this example of Potiphar. So in verse 3, where he said, you know, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, that's a witness. That is a strong witness. From the book um, Education, is this, uh, page 138, is this quote. It says, Thus our business or calling is a part of God's great plan. So, if you're an accountant, or whatever, whatever your business is, whatever you do. And he says, and as so long as it is conducted in accordance with his will, he himself is responsible for the results. Isn't that great? That's an, that's an awesome promise. doesn't matter what, our, what line of work we're in, what business we're in. If God is with us and we're doing his will and we do it in accordance with his will, God himself is responsible for the results. That should be something that should be very encouraging for us um, as we look at it. God is responsible for the results. Here's uh, another quote from Desire of Ages. It says, There is nothing save the selfish heart of man that lives unto himself. No bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves upon the ground, but ministers to some other life. There is no leaf of the forest or a lowly blade of grouse, but has its ministry that independence, that trying to do things on our own uh, can be to our own detriment. But if we partner and we collaborate with God, there are promises that, are, that we just are missing out on because God's the one that says that he'll be responsible for the results, that he is responsible for the results. To me, that is a, a great uh, promise. So Joseph found favor in the sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had put under his authority. It says Joseph found favor in his sight. There are a lot of examples in Scripture if you do a search about finding favor, you know, uh, of people who found favor uh, with God. But Joseph found grace in the sight and served him and made him an overseer of his house. So was Joseph blessed? Yes, he was blessed. He, he made him ruler over everything he had. Tell me about Joseph again. He was a slave. He was a Hebrew, sold into slavery. And what about Potiphar, an Egyptian, a high-ranking military official, perhaps in charge of Pharaoh's bodyguard, captain of the guard, a non-believer? Potiphar, Potiphar must have had hundreds of Egyptian slaves and servants that you know, he could have chosen, but yet he chose Joseph. Uh, because of Joseph's character, because Joseph had a collaboration with God. Another example that I'd share with you that's very similar is one of Daniel. Daniel is another one that collaborated with God. He had a partnership with God. In Daniel 1, remember, um, he was another slave just like Joseph. He was captured, taken to a foreign land, served a foreign leader who knows nothing about Daniel's God. But Daniel had a proper upbringing. Um, in Daniel 1, verse 6, says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now look at verse 9. It says, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. 
So Daniel's in partnership with God. Who took care of fulfilling and helping Daniel out here? When Daniel purposed in his heart, he says, now God. God is the one that was responsible to put that in the heart of the chief of the eunuchs to help him out. So what does it mean to be brought in favor? You know, an example might be one of a church is trying to do something. Maybe they're trying to build uh, a new building. But City Hall is giving them a problems, right? There's obstacles. So the church prays for this church facility because it's being used not for their glory, but for the glory of God. If you're partner with God, maybe that city official will say yes and get the permits out a lot quicker because God put it in his heart, right? Not because of anything that we do, but if we're partnered with God and we're being faithful, God's going to move and work for us and do things for us, um, which I think is an incredible promise that we should be taking advantage, more, taking more advantage of in our lives. If God is with us, who can be against us? Um, so let me show you what it means when it says Joseph found grace in his sight and we need to understand powerful ways that God works. Um, in the story of the Egyptians, um, um, when they were in Egypt and now Joseph's lineage is growing and multiplied, right? And they're all there um, and they're coming out. This is uh, something that God says, and I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be when you go, that you shall not go empty-handed. You know, it's kind of interesting. It's like, in that story, God says this, right? That he was going to give him favor with the people. Um, but if you're slaves and you're running away or you're leaving, why would you give them money? Why would you, why would you do, you know, why would you reward them for leaving? The only reason is because God said so. God spoke it. God put it in their hearts, right? And so in that story, we see how God works for his people, works for those who are partnered with him. Um, Proverbs 16, 7 says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's kind of what we saw with, with the Egyptians. You know, they, they, they gave him. And so because Joseph was with God, God gave him favor in the sight of Potiphar. Because God was with Joseph. And why did God give the Israelites favor in the sight of Egypt, the Egyptians? Because God was with the Israelites. Rebellious though they were, God was still with them. Going back to Daniel, uh, Daniel uh, chapter 6, verse 1, says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom uh, 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, and the satraps might give account to them, so that the king would suffer no loss. Verse 3, Then Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was with him, and the king gave him uh, gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the organizational chart of this king, Artaxerxes, was it's him, and then he had three presidents. Under the three presidents were 120 satraps. That's the organizational chart. But he put Daniel in, on top. So now you had the king, Daniel, two presidents, and 120 satraps. That was, that was the organizational chart that uh, the king was looking at. Again, Daniel was a prisoner. You know, he was taken as an exile um, in a context that around people that were not Christian. You know, so he was, he was there uh, among a, a pagan land. And then in verse 4, it says this, So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. So the other presidents, the two presidents, they obviously have access to all the, you know, all the secret files. They have access to all the information. And so they wanted to find out what kind of person Daniel was, that they were trying to find something to accuse him of. But guess what? You know the story. They couldn't find anything to accuse him. And it says that he was faithful. That means that Daniel was a good worker, right? The way he conducted his business at work, he was faithful. He didn't take anything. He didn't steal any pens. He didn't take any staplers, you know, to take them for his own personal use. He didn't do any of that. 
he was, you know, he was, he was upright in, in how he conducted business. Maybe there was ad- additional monies or things coming in. He didn't siphon them off to the side there, you know, and uh, he conducted business in a way because he was partnered with God. He collaborated with God, and so he was upright in everything he did. They couldn't find anything, you know, to blame him against. So, I mean, he's, he ran the business and the organization of that, running that country um, in an upright way. We look at our world today and see how many, um, you know, the world just kind of broken. People, you know, are out for themselves only. Um, and they siphon money to do their own things. And, and the people then starve and don't get goods and services because of the way they, the way they live. They could not find anything wrong because Daniel... He worked on time. He was faithful. He was thorough. He, had a, he was attention to detail. He went the extra mile. Nobody could find any fault with him. If he had to be graded, you know, they would have to give him an A. His, his work and his character were inseparable. His work and his character were inseparable. For someone to search your background and find nothing wrong, that says something really about your partnership with God. Another example that I'll give to you is uh, offer you is Nehemiah, and this one will be quick. Nehemiah is an example of one uh, person who, through his actions, the things that he did, he was also in a foreign land, not among his people, uh, but serving this king. And he had a prayer in Nehemiah verse one eleven. He had a prayer, and he says, "Oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant." and to the prayer of your servant who desires to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day. I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, this man being the king. So Nehemiah makes this prayer in chapter 1. He prays for success. He prays that God would intervene and touch the heart of the king. So in Nehemiah 2 verse 1 it says, And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king, the wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before sad in his presence. So here we see Nehemiah going up to the king, and the king recognizes that there's something wrong. That He sees his face, and he says there's something wrong. Um, There's something not quite right. Ellen White says that um, when the love uh, of God is in you, it would show in your face. So, um, therefore, in continuing on in verse 2, it says, Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. You know, so it's like the king noticed something was wrong with Nehemiah. Nehemiah didn't say anything, but the king saw it in his face. He saw that something was wrong, and he says, uh, said to him, there's something going on here. So from God's amazing grace, it says, love is manifested in kindness, gentleness, forbearance, and long-suffering. The countenance is changed. Christ's abiding in the heart shines out in the faces of those who love him and keep his commandments. That's interesting. I never realized that that would come through my face, how my character you know, the, the, the work that God is, does in my heart, you know, that love is manifesting in kindness, gentleness, forbearance, and that is also reflected in our faces, um, that our faces, you know, will, will, will do that. And that's how the king knew that there was something wrong uh, with Nehemiah. So Nehemiah, verse 2, uh, 3, and 4, and he said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lies waste and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make a request? He's like, What do you want, Nehemiah? What are you asking for? And so verse 6 says, Then the king said to me, the queen also uh, sitting beside him, How long will you journey be? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. So he, all the king wanted to know was, when are you going to be back? Right? That's all the king wanted to know. When are you going to be back? And did God answer Nehemiah's prayer? Did God give him favor with the king? 
Yes, he gave him favor. He was able to return, and not only that, but he gave him supplies to rebuild the wall. He did all that. God was the one working. Nehemiah was just a partner with God, and he trusted God, and so he lived a different lifestyle. He says, I said to the king, if it please the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. So I've given you three examples, um, and then the example of Jesus, what he did. Even though Jesus was God, he did not choose to do things by himself. He collaborated with his Father. He waited on the Lord. He means he intertwined. He, he was connected. You know, and in that image of kind of having a braid, like a, like a rope that's twisted. So when we wait on the Lord, we're twisted. We're connected with him. That means that we go where he goes, that we do the things that he wants us to do. And a lot of times our actions and the way we conduct ourselves, it might not be by the words we say, but by the things that we do and how we treat others that people will know and say, the Lord is with that person. Because they now see God. They don't see me, but they're seeing God. My, my partner, my real partner, right? My business partner, the, the one that wants to be seen. We want him to be seen in others. Um, and that's a different way of living. And I hope somebody maybe already is thinking of making that kind of commitment to say, Father, let me change the way I run my life. Please, God, come now to be the senior partner. You tell me what to do through your word, and I'll do it. Because if you have a partnership with God, and because he's the senior par partner, He's responsible for the results. God wants to collaborate with you and me. And the ultimate purpose is the salvation, not only of your souls, but the souls of others and your circle of influence. So those who come around us, those that they can see Jesus, that they can see them in the way you conduct your life. This life continues on for the believer. Um, some people think that, um, you know, when Jesus comes, you know, um, he's going to change. I mean, it's going to be different. Um, but I don't think that that's really what happens. It, is, it, is, it does stop for the non-believer. For the sinner, life stops, you know, you know, and doesn't continue. But for the believer, life continues because we are in a journey with God. We're in a partnership. We're continuing to grow. We're doing those things because we are connected with God. It doesn't, it doesn't not, Jesus is not going to come and all of a sudden we're going to, you know, we're going to have to live differently. No, we're always going to have to live dependent on God. Even in heaven, we have to be connected with God. It doesn't mean that, because that was part of sin, is to be independent, to, to do things your own way. But God's shown us, Jesus showed us in his life, that he was totally dependent on his Father. And that's the way we need to live our lives, to be totally dependent on God for everything. Every aspect of our life, every decision that we make, everything that we do. And you know what? The results of that is that God promises to bless us. And that's, that's encouraging because now we're not alone. We've got the, somebody who has ultimate resources that can provide it. So if you have problems, job, work, whatever it might be, your senior partner has your back. And to me, that's an encouraging uh, aspect of how to way that I want to live my life. And that's something that I, I, I want to I do that. I want to ask the Lord to help me put him in, in everything that I do, in every aspect of life. I don't want to say, Lord, stay out of this or stay out of that. I want him to take over everything. And that, uh, that's against our human nature. But in, a, in the end, it is a more successful way of living. But God will bless us even more abundantly. So um, with that, I know that uh, we are going to be going to um, nominating committee pretty soon. People are going to be calling, you know, you and saying, would you serve in this capacity? Would you do this? I'll tell you a couple of things. One is you, you might be asked to do something you've never done before. But I hope that you, by today's message, you will know that you, you don't have to fear that. You don't have to be afraid of that because it's not going to be you that's responsible for the results. God is responsible for the results. He just wants you to be a laborer together with him. So if you do get a call, I encourage you to um, accept it. Take it on. It might, not be, it might be out of, maybe a little bit out of your comfort zone or maybe you don't know, like I, I don't, I've never done this before. 
it's okay. You're not alone. God is with you. He will labor together with you, and he's responsible for the results. So as you, as you get you know, these calls, pray about it. Keep an open mind. But I encourage you, you will be blessed by serving. There's no greater reward than serving others. Um, and so how best that we can serve here amongst each other. We're family. We can serve one another. So that kind of just gives us the impetus to be able to serve others that are outside of our, you know, spheres. So anyway, keep that in mind and uh, let us pray. Father, we thank you that um, the results are not up to us, but the results are up to you. And so, Lord, we just want to pledge ourselves to labor together with you. We want to collaborate with you. We want to work together with you, Lord, to finish the work that uh, you have started. Uh, we long to be in your kingdom. We long to leave this world. But we know that your ultimate plan is to restore this world to what it was intentionally to be and that this will become the center of the universe at some point in time when you, um, when you come back and you make things all new again. So Lord, um, we just pray that you would be with everyone here, be with every family represented here, um, and just pray, Lord, that uh, your spirit would guide us, that others might see you in us, that you become our senior partner. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.